Well, with that, let's jump in. If you uh, like to take notes, if you're a note taker, there are sermon notes inside your bulletin on that purple insert there. I'll kind of point those out to you along the way. And we're going to be in 1 John 4, 8. That's our, our focus verse. I'm going to have a couple of other verses. If you need a Bible, there should be some in the pews, or pews, the chairs in front of you. Uh, there are Bibles in our Welcome Center. If you don't own one, grab one, take it home with you. That's our gift to you. You're welcome to use your iPhone, your iPad. I would just say, though, if you're going to use your iPhone or iPad, use your data, because our internet here, not good. Okay, so uh, if you're trying to get onto our internet, you're just going to crash it. It it's doesn't have the power, but you're welcome to use your iPhone. I will believe that you're not on Facebook, that you're using the Bible, right? <laughs> Promise? Okay, good. What we're talking about today, though, is the love of God. Uh, you know, what are the things that God loves? When we're in a relationship with somebody, we, we try to get to know those things that people love and hate, right? And, and, and particularly the things that people love, because we want to do more of those things. And then, of course, we want to avoid the things that that person might hate. And the same, of course, then is, is true with God. But before I get going too far here today, uh, I want to hear from you a little bit about the different things that some of us, that, 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 that we love and hate. Those things that we love and hate make us all different, right? And, and so, so first, by a show of hands, how many of you hate country music? Yeah? we got some country music haters, right? Some, some, people, some people, when they hear country music, they're like, I don't understand this. It's like, you took my dog, you took my girl, you took my truck, there's no point to life, right? And other people are like, no, 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 I love it. Let's two-step the night away, right? All my exes really do live in Texas, right? <laughs> right? Anybody there? You know, you know, whether it's George Strait or Kenny Chesney or, ooh, hunky, hunky, Blank Shelton, right? Uh, some of you just say, hey, man, play me some country music, right? Yeah, that's, that's some people, too. How about sushi? Who likes sushi? Yeah, we got some sushi lovers in here. Sushi is one of those things, pretty much a love it or hate it kind of thing. Some people go... I hate sushi. I don't understand it. You need to like put a flame to that thing. It, that's not right. You should cook your food before you eat it, right? Other people are like, I don't care if the sushi bar is at a truck stop. I'm eating, right? No? None of you taking truck stop sushi? Yeah, well, that's probably a wise life choice, right? How about this one? Are you fans of the Green Bay Packers? We got one fan, two fans. We got two fans today. Yeah, yeah, three. We got, we got some brave souls. We will pray for you after the service. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, no. We, we, we will be kind to the Green Bay Packer fans. How many of you are Minnesota Vikings fans, though? There we go. See, that's the dominant team. We live in Minnesota. It makes sense. We got Viking shirts all over the room. But see, there's, there's things that, that, that we all love and hate, right? And, and that is true with God as well. And so, so what is it? What is it that God loves? And, and why does God love? And, and how does God love? And that's, that's what we're going to be talking about here today. Uh, a little bit uh, about me. Um, some of the things that I love. You know, I, I've got a wife. You saw her up here, Kimberly. I love her. I have a son, Justice. A uh, great son. Love my son, Justice. He's nine, he and he's a great kid. I, I love things like, I love to learn, right? And I love to read, and it's a great combination, because I'll, I'll read about just about anything, and I'll, I love to learn about just about anything. There's hardly a thing under the sun that I, I'm not a little bit curious about. So I, I love to learn, and I love to grow, and I'll read about anything you give me the chance to read. I love riding my motorcycle. Many of you have seen that. If you see a, a, a blue blur go by you at some point, um, that's probably me. Sorry, I, I'm not patient when it comes to speed and traffic and those kinds of things all the time. And of course, as I said earlier, I love this church. I love you. I'm so glad that you are here today. And, and when we talk about love, and when we talk about love specifically in our relationship with God, we need to understand that God and His love goes far beyond what we understand as love. God, God loves in ways and in depths that, that we can't even comprehend, frankly. And that is a really good thing for us. There's something very foundational about God that we have to understand when we go to talk about God and, and how He loves. And the first thing is, if you're taking notes, 
Uh, it's kind of a, a foundational truth that we have to understand about God and who God is. If we want to understand God and God's love, it's that love is not what God does, but love is who God is. Love is not what God does, but love is who God is. And we see that quite clearly in 1 John 4 eight, where the scripture says that anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. You see, love is not what God does, but it is who God is, right? It's the, it's the very essence and nature of God. Love is who God is. But that, that, that poses a problem in our heads. Because sometimes, if God is love, I mean, if God really is love, then why sometimes don't I always feel God's love, right? Right? I may not be close and feel God's love all the time. Well, I think there's a, a lot of different reasons why we may not feel God's love. And we're going to talk about three of those today, about why it is that we may not feel God's love. And if you're taking notes, I would invite you to jump right in with me here. Why is it we don't feel God's love even though God is love? And the first note there along with this is that maybe, just maybe, we are not seeking God's love. We're not seeking God's love like we should, right? We're just not always seeking God. That, that's the way it does work, unfortunately. Even for pastors sometimes. Sometimes we don't feel God's love in our life, and it's our fault, right? Here's a beautiful truth that's found in Matthew 6.33, where the Bible says this. It says, Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all of these things shall be added unto you. You see, when we, when we seek God, when we're pursuing a relationship with him, God is there for us. He's there for the finding. When we seek him, we'll see the provision that he has given to us in our lives. We'll see his blessing. They will become clear to us while we are seeking him. When we seek God, that is when we will be able to see His love for us. But the thing is, we have to put it to work. We, we have to get involved. It doesn't just happen, folks. You see, your pastor can't do it for you. Your youth pastor can't do it for you. Your wife, your husband can't do it for you. Nobody else can do it for you. The Bible is clear that we must seek God. And then as we and while we are seeking God, it is then that we will see His love for us. Understand how relationships work. We can't just put God on a shelf, right, and expect that we're going to keep feeling all of God's love, to have this good relationship with Him when we've kind of put Him on the back burner, right? We have to invest time into that relationship, just like any other relationship that we value. Seek God. One of the main reasons we sometimes don't feel God's love is simply because we are not seeking Him. Now the second thing, if you're taking notes, is this. It's that simply we don't love like God loves, right? We don't love like God loves. We see this principle in 1 John 4, 10 through 11. It says, this is love. Not that we love God, but that He loved us, and He sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, John writes, since God so loved us, because of that, so then we ought to then love one another. Now that's setting the bar pretty high, right? Because, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't send any of my family to die for your sins. And I doubt you'd send any of your family to die for my sins, right? How many of you want to send your kids for my sins? Anyone? No. God set a standard way up above about love. 
loving us despite anything that we might be doing. We don't always love like God loves. We all have room to grow here, right? Because here's the deal. If we're going to try to live like Jesus lived, we're going to have to love like Jesus loved. The problem is we don't do this naturally, do we? We have many things that kind of pull us this way and that way, and, and we can easily become distracted and easily become frustrated with people and, and just get to that point where you just want to smack somebody occasionally, right? You ever get there? Am I the only one? Seriously? All right. But you get to that point, you're like, I can't believe this. Right? And we get upset because we don't love like God loves. And of course, I want to say, that ah, that never happens to me. I love like God loves. But that would be a lie. I get frustrated at times, right? Lots of things drive me crazy. You can ask my wife and son. I, I have all kinds of weird things that drive me crazy. And I get, I get frustrated by things. One of the things that drives me crazy is poorly trained waiters and waitresses. <laughs> See, I spent 10 years of my life professionally training people how to wait tables. If you're a bad server, I understand. But if you've just not been trained, that's not the server's fault. I don't punish them. It frustrates me so much when businesses don't train their staff properly, right? Another thing, oh, I, like I said, I, got, I, I go all day about things that drive me crazy. And I've mentioned this one before, but in this day and age, you're still writing checks at the checkout at the grocery store? <laughs> Didn't checks go out with the cassette tapes? We have check cards. They even have a little digital chip in them now, right? And there's still people writing checks. Oh, if that's you, I pray for you. Or at least pray for me, one of the two. I don't know which of us needs the help. One of us does. Another thing that drives me nuts, drives me crazy. If you chew gum and I can hear you doing it, I'm not sure we can be friends. <laughs> Chewing gum is not a group activity. <laughs> and don't get me started about driving through a roundabout properly. <laughs> I may go stand outside a Paulbex one of these days with an instructional video for people. We all get frustrated, don't we? And I get so frustrated with people at times. And many times, there's so many different things that we can find that will get us easily frustrated and lead us to anger, right? But that's not God. God's not like that. Because love is not what God does, but love is who God is. And it makes it difficult sometimes for us to even understand God and relate to God, to feel God's love, because we don't understand how, how someone could love in this infinite and endless sort of way. Because we don't love in the same way as God. God, God loves us despite how annoying we are, frankly, right? We're a mess, and He loves us anyhow. We're broken. He's perfect. Yet he loves us. And that's because he is love. It's not just something God does. Which, as I mentioned, is great news for you and for me. Now the third thing, if you're taking notes, is what I believe is possibly the broadest answer but the one that hits probably closest to home for many of us. We might not feel, we might not understand, we might not see, we not, might not feel like we are experiencing God's love. And one of the reasons for that, I believe, is simply this. We don't feel God's love because we don't feel like we are worthy. A lot of us, a lot of us don't, don't really feel like we are worthy of God's love. Well, in Romans 5.8, the Bible tells us this. But God shows His love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So in other words, 
You don't have to try to become worthy for God to send Christ for you. But a lot of us kind of struggle with that. You see, a lot of us, we, we, we want to earn it, right? We want to deserve it. We want to contribute towards it. We want to be able to point at something and say, that right there is the reason why God loves me. Right? We want to point at it and say, this right here is why God loves me. I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and God darn it, God loves me. Remember Stuart Smalley? Well, yeah, God does love you, right? That's true. But not because of what you have done. You're not good enough. God is perfect, and you're not. Sorry. You're not Mr. Perfect, bud. Sorry. And not only is God perfect, but God is all-knowing, right? I don't care how smart you are, you don't measure up to all-knowing, right? But God has chosen to love you anyhow. God loves you not because you are worthy, but because He thinks that you have worth. God values you. He created you. He loves you. He loved you even before you were born, folks. He, he's loved you at your very, very worst and even at your best. That's grace. Only God can love like that. He knew, he knew we couldn't earn His love, but He sent Jesus anyhow. Because God is love. Even when we don't feel worthy of that love. This is played out beautifully in Scripture in Genesis 3. Way in the very beginning of your Bible. It's the story of Adam and Eve, right? Many of you know this well. And Adam and Eve, of, of course, in the, they're in the Garden of Eden. And, and everything is great, right? Glorious. It's good. God created it, and it was good. And they are enjoying all this good stuff. And God says to Adam and Eve, He says, Hey, listen, you got all this great stuff. Enjoy it. Have fun. Be fruitful. Multiply, right? But just don't eat the fruit from this tree. Anything else, you're good. Just don't do this. Spoiler alert. So what do they do? <laughs> they take a bite out of the very fruit, out of that tree that they told them not to do. And because of that, sin enters and their eyes are open. And all of a sudden, if you've read your Old Testament, you know... Adam and Eve eat this fruit, and they're all of a sudden like, oh, we're naked. They'd been naked all along. They just finally realized it. And they feel, as the Bible says, they feel ashamed. You see, they had been in this constant relationship with God, and all of a sudden, it's now broken. Why? Because they had distanced themselves from God. They're, they're, they're over here, doing their own thing now. And God comes into the garden, right? Walking through the garden, and what does Adam do? Adam says, oh, we're naked. I'm going to hide over here in this bush, right? I'm going to get down here. Hope maybe God won't notice us. Maybe God won't see us. God already knew they were naked. Why was he hiding? Because he felt ashamed, right? Well, that's, what many of us do as well. We say, if only. If, if, if only people knew what I thought. If only people knew how I felt about this situation. If only people realized that I'm not a great person. If only people knew that I, I put on this facade, this false front. If, if only people knew that I'm not as good of a Christian as I kind of pretend to be. If, if, if only people knew that I struggle to pray, it's hard for me. And I don't, I don't always feel God's love a lot. And it's, and it's hard, and I don't, I don't always read my Bible like I should. And, oh, if only people knew that about me. If they knew all this stuff. And so, we might put on this 
show, but we know on the inside we're ashamed. And so we put this distance between ourselves and God, and we, we, like Adam and Eve, try to hide. That's what many of us do. But if you're checking it out, look at Genesis 3. God says, God walks into the garden, and he says, Hey, Adam, where are you? God's saying that to us today. He's saying, Mary, where are you today? Morgan, where are you today? John, where are you today? Right? And where are we? We're like, I'm over here, I'm hiding, God. Just like Adam. Why? Because a lot of times we feel like we're not good enough for God's love. I don't really feel good enough. If God only knew, hey folks, God knows. But we, we, we feel shameful, right? We feel guilty. We feel unlovable at times. Sometimes we go, I know God, I should be seeking you, but I'm not. And so God comes and he says, Adam, where are you? Adam says, I'm hiding. God says, why? Adam says, because I'm naked and I'm ashamed. God looks at Adam and what does he say? Adam, who told you that? Adam, who told you that? God says the same to us today, folks. Who told you that? Who told you that you were a shameful thing? Who told you that you should be holding on to guilt for the decision that you made years ago? Who told you that? Who told you that you're not worthy of God's love because of something in your past? You see, in Ephesians 2.10, the Bible says this. We are God's workmanship. The New Living Translation translated as this. We are God's masterpiece, right? And we are created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. That's a beautiful truth, folks. Not something that, that we can become worthy of. God says, hey, while you were still a mess, while you were still a sinner, while you still stank of sin, even before you knew me, I created you in Christ's image. And you are my masterpiece. And I created you to do good works, which I have prepared in advance for you. Quite a number of years ago, I had the opportunity. I, I watched, you, you may have seen one of these guys before, a, a chainsaw artist, right? And they take huge stumps of trees and they, they, they wield these chainsaws just amazingly, right? And so I, I got to watch this guy, and I didn't plan on spending most of an afternoon watching him, but I ended up spending a whole afternoon watching this guy create. And so he had this, this huge portion of a tree. I don't even know. It must have been an oak or something. It was gigantic. And uh, he took out this first chainsaw, right? And he'd been commissioned. He'd, he kind of gave a little spiel before he started cutting. He said, I've been commissioned. I've got to make this into an eagle. And I'm going to be working on that throughout the day today. You're welcome to stand and watch, yada, yada, yada. And so he fires up that first chainsaw. It's his big chainsaw. And, and he starts just roughing it out. You know, I, I would have to draw something on there. But this guy doesn't. He just gets up there and just, just starts taking, you know, with this big saw, just starts taking hunks of wood out, right? And at first it just looked like a tree, but with this big saw, he's able to just start taking chunks out of it. And it, and it begins, amazingly, to start to vaguely take on the, the rough shape, the rough form of, of a, like a seven foot tall eagle. He's got ladders and chairs and all kinds of things he's standing on. I mean, this thing is going to be huge when he's done. And so he, he's about 75% of the way, I think, through rough cutting. And he's done like three of the four kind of sides of this humongous tree trunk that he's working on. And, and he makes this cut and the wood sound changes. And he keeps cutting for a moment. And like a big chunk basically falls out of this tree. You see, what had happened was at some point in time, a long, long time in the past, something had happened. Something got into that tree and, and damaged that tree. Well, the tree grew around it and grew over it and kind of covered up that, that broken part, right? And it wasn't exposed until this guy got out the saws and he started cutting into it. And, and literally, when, when this 
chunk of wood fell off as he's working with the saw and this damage is exposed on the inside of the street. There were gasps that were loud enough I could hear them over the chainsaw. I mean, people were like, oh, what's he going to do? This is tragic, right? He killed his chainsaw. He picked up a, a smaller chainsaw at this point, and uh, he just started cutting into that that broken part of this tree and starts just cutting and sawing and it's like right in front of him so we couldn't see very well because he was kind of blocking and and for like the next half hour he's just he's working he's sawing he's cutting wood chunks flying you know sawdust everywhere and after about 30 minutes he kind of stepped back and as he stepped back inside of this hole in the tree was this beautiful relief of an American flag people literally clapped it was amazing I'm not kidding. People clapped. Nobody could have imagined that this gaping hole, this mess, this hidden problem could be cleaned up, could be fixed, and could be used for something good. That's true with us, folks. A lot of times, we are just like that. We are broken in ways that other people can't see or we don't want other people to even see. But God sees it. And you take that brokenness and you put it into the hands of the Creator and all of a sudden something beautiful begins to happen. All of a sudden God starts saying, look, I know you were broken, but you don't have to stay that way. I have something greater planned for you. You are my masterpiece. You were created in Christ Jesus to do good works that I have prepared for you in advance. In fact, you know what God says? I don't think like you do. I don't love like you do. Because I am love. Isaiah 55 says this, that God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways. He says, I see something different. You know what? You see something broken. I see something beautiful. I see something that I can utilize. Something that I can transform and create a new purpose with. Give it new meaning. A new creation in Christ. If you will put your hope and trust in me, God says. So what is it that God loves? God loves to take a broken and a hurting people and make beautiful things. Because God is love. And that's exactly why we worship him and will continue to do so. Amen? Let's pray.